Welcome to the Psychology Talk podcast. We are your hosts, Dr. Scott Hoy, clinical psychologist, and Kyle Miller, licensed counselor. Psychology Talk is a unique conversation about psychology around the globe. We speak with psychology experts to keep you informed about current issues and trends. We advocate toward reducing stigma and educate about mental health. While you're listening, Please take a moment to give us a review and subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Spreaker, or your favorite streaming service. It helps us to continue providing you with quality programming. And now, enjoy the episode. Hello, everyone. Today, my guest is Bridget Dengel Gaspard. Bridget has an MSW from Columbia University. She has experience with dialectical behavioral therapy and cognitive behavioral therapy from years of work with clients. She primarily works with inner voice dialogue and is the founder of the New York Voice Dialogue Institute. She is the author of the recently published book, The Final Eighth, Enlist Your Inner Selves to Accomplish Your Goals. Bridget, welcome to the Psychology Talk podcast. Thank you. It's great to be here, Scott. Okay. Well, we're happy to have you here. So I'm going to open up the floor to you. You can, you know, sometimes we ask people, how do they got into the business of being in the business of mental health? Um, and uh, we've spoken before, so I know you have an interesting story, kind of parallels mine to a certain degree. But I'll, how did you get here? <laughs> <laughs> I love that question. Yes. And we do have a lot of parallels. So Basically, I'll start in high school, but only stay there for a second. But I always said I wanted to be an actress or a therapist. I don't know why. I also always said I wanted to help people reach their potential. So that, I think, came in with me. I don't know where that came from. Honestly, that feels like it came from just my essence. Mm -hmm. So long story short, I ended up pursuing acting and uh, was a professional performer and stand-up comic and improviser in New York City and loved it. And in that era of my life, I was always looking for creativity tools. And so I stumbled upon voice dialogue and I actually read it or I read about it in this book called uh, Healing the Shame That Binds You by Bradshaw, oh, which I'm yeah, sure classic, you know that book. Yeah. It's a classic. Yeah. And even though he has passed and that book is probably maybe 30, 40 years old, I recommend to all your listeners, I think it's still extraordinary. So I was also struggling with my own healing that I needed uh, emotionally and psychologically. And so I know that that book talk, spoke to me because of the topic of shame. But in the back of that book, he highlighted a bunch of what we call alternative therapies, which I don't love that word. But voice dialogue was discussed, like seven pages of this thing called voice dialogue. When I read that, I was electrified. Literally, I said, I need to know more. So I hunted down the developers, the doctors, Hal and Sidra Stone, which meant I went and got their 800 number. And I said, hmm, we're going back a few I years. Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> 800number.com. Yeah. Um, that was the old dot com, <laughs> the prehistoric dot com. Mm. And so that's how I stumbled upon voice dialogue. So it's basically a technique where you embody different parts of yourself, also called alter egos, subpersonalities, inner selves. It's part of the parts therapy world, as mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. And in so doing, I knew it would expand my creativity because I was working on characters and I was also writing sketches and I wrote a uh, two woman show and I was correct. It literally would help me get into different points of views and it was so much fun. Mm -hmm. And that's why I loved it. But then I started to get training in it as after I started to get my own voice dialogue sessions, I started to learn how to do it so I could teach others how to do it as well as help people get their own facilitations. Scott, the healing I saw so quickly and so profoundly through this technique inspired me to change my career. I started to kind of get bored with what really became pursuing acting as opposed to acting and that's why I then applied 
and got into Columbia University School of Social Work with the idea that I wanted to be a private practice supervisor, but I also wanted expertise, experience and training in mental health field itself. And that's how I got the dialectical behavior therapy certification, which I don't have at the time at now, but I had it then cognitive behavioral therapy. And I know different degrees for mental health, uh, stress, different things, but in social work, it's really about also about functioning. And these were areas I didn't really pay as much attention to. So I really learned so much more than I even expected. Now I've come full circle and I've got all this creativity work that I love. And frankly, I think part of being stuck in terms of not feeling well in terms of mental health is partly because people are stuck creatively, like they go hand in hand. And so now I've written this book, which helps people um, do voice dialogue on their own as in terms of getting to their inner selves. Because in my private practice, I realized so many people were struggling with having problems just crossing their finish line. They had lots of energy to work hard and get close to the goal. Like me, this Mm -hmm. is one of my wounds too, but not cross the finish line, not go from contender to victor. And that's what this book is about. So the final eighth is kind of, it's, it's your, it is very much steeped in, in your voice, uh, dialogue, but it sounds like you're, you, you saw one area where you could, you could flush it out with people and encapsulate it in a way that um, uh, could help people almost at that, that, that last, last little bit, right before the end of the breaking the wall, so to speak, in the marathon. Exactly. And it came out whole. Again, it feels like the muse visited me. Suddenly, I saw, I'm like, this is a thing. And it came out final eighth because people had worked hard and I knew it because I was working with them. So I knew they weren't deluded about their effort, about their dedication or about their talent or their expertise. And it happened with my lawyer clients. It happened with my entertainment business clients. And that's when I realized, wow, this is across the board. And you could argue, oh, creatives, what have this reputation for being insecure or something? No, it did not matter. And that's when I'm like, this is a thing. And and it came out whole. This is a final eighth. And then I started to explain it to my clients in my private practice. And it was so healing because in that sense, people can say, yes. Now I can see it. I can put a name to it. And mm-hmm. and now that I can say this is a final eighth issue, we can see what's going on, which means parts of you have permission to work hard, but other parts don't have permission to succeed. And so ultimately, it's a success issue. Mm-hmm. And we don't have okay. a lot of respect in our society for success issues, right? Get the violin out. Oh, poor you. Are you having a success issue? Well, there's a lot of fear to be successful. Mm-hmm. And I don't think it's recognized and it's certainly not acknowledged as the um, as a place where people really need a lot of help and support. Well, I mean, um, I do think that that there is a, a fear of success more than there is a fear of failure. I think that and, and I, I having read the book and kind of talking to you prior, I know that it's at final eighth, that little like, that's where the real the growth edges are for people, right? If they, if they're having this issue, do you also kind of help people reframe and and redefine what success means? Yes, Uh absolutely. So the, the great thing about the final eighth process is when you go to different parts of yourself, it's like curious investigation. You ask a part, well, what do you think? What's your idea of success? Why are you for the goal? Why are you against the goal, depending on the the self? And then you always come back to center to process it. So when we dig into the points of view of the different cells, we're not asking any self to change their mind. We just want to know what their mind is. And then a lot of times people realize, wow, part of the reason I'm stuck is not actually because I don't, I, I, I'm afraid of being an X or a Y or a Z. It's because I don't really want it. That was something my parents wanted for me. And so often I call that like upgrading your software. Well, what do you want today? What, what intrigues you? What resonates with you now? And so, yeah, often it's like, these are things not even considered. So people start to go, yeah, what do, what is success? What do I like? 
Mm-hmm. I know what I was told. Do I agree? Did I once agree, but not anymore? Yeah. And so that is freeing because it makes you not be in the victim kind of failure paradigm. It's more like, let me take control of this. What's here? Let's clean house. What kind of house do I even want anymore? Do I want a house? Let's, okay. Uh, let's step back a little bit. Maybe what we can do is we can um, help the people in the audience who maybe have never heard of parts work or the idea that people are polypsychic rather than unipsychic, right? Or an individual eye, but they have different aspects to themselves that kind of take over and, and um, run the show. Uh, when consciously we're thinking, why am I doing this to myself? Or why can't I do X? Or why do I do X? Or why? Um, but maybe you can kind of like give a little background into the idea of of parts, about uh, people's different parts of their mind or their personas. So a healthy personality consists of many selves. And There's this fear about uh, now called disassociative identity disorder, right? That it's a disorder. But in fact, and brain imaging more and more research in that department is showing that we actually envision our different parts using different parts of our brains. So it's this idea of being multiple parts goes back to the ancient Greeks and that different parts of us have wisdom. And so now modern science is catching up and proving those early days of your, uh, like Socrates and Plato and the shadow and all of that. But this idea of having to be consistent, it, it is a value that is out there and consistent equals like I'm one person and somehow you, you're, you're wrong or you're odd or weird or disordered because you actually aren't just one person. So I want to acknowledge there is this societal expectation that actually traps people. And then what happens, and you said it, you get flooded. So mm-hmm. you have a few drinks and suddenly a happy, flirty Sally comes out and is talks with ease and flirts and has fun in a way that's not allowed when you're in your consistent self. And so what happens biologically, say, with a substance like that, you actually loosen up your controls. But the truth is you always have your flirty inner Sally as part of you. You just don't let it out. And that's okay. But this method gives you control or the opposite. Someone drinks and they just become an enraged, destructive person. Then when they end up after they've done their damage, after the substance has worn off and they're in hangover, they often feel horrible guilt, horrible shame, horrible self-hate. And they're honestly like, what happened? So these cells flood you. And what voice dialogue and other parts work and the final eighth process helps you gain control over it. Because the more you know about your own angry self, you don't have to be in denial about it. Then it's like you have better control. You can let out a little steam, not have a geyser suddenly go off and destroy a relationship. Mm -hmm. And the fear is with these selves, like anger selves or these selves that are hidden or in shadow, that it will destroy the relationship. Well, many people have grown up in households that that's, for example, how anger was. Anger was either completely repressed and then every, say, I don't know, couple of weeks, somebody in the family would go off and be destructive. Mm -hmm. So then you end up being terrified of anger and it's legitimate. But But what happens is if you approach that part of yourself, the fear recedes because you always feel better when you know something. Like they say, it's better to know your enemy than to not know your enemy. And you realize even anger is your friend. One of my favorite exercises, I don't know if you do a version of this, Scott, is what are five good things about? What are five good things about your angry self? Mm -hmm. I can tell you, if we want to do it now, like five good things, a few good things. It tells me when I feel uh, like I've been, my boundary's been crossed. Mm -hmm. I need to protect myself. Well, that's good information for me. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah. Or injustice. Oh, yeah. I, I, I spend a lot of time with many of my patients going over their um, disowned or disenfranchised parts of their self, whether or not I'm specifically using a kind of parts modality, right? Um, like, like uh, 
internal family systems or um, ego state therapy or whatnot, but mostly just getting people to say it's okay. I mean, you're, why why are you feeling this anger? Like, what do you think its message might be? Or what's good about it? And usually uh, that that throws people off a little bit, you know. But but it's that accepting of it, yeah. But but go ahead, you you the five things. I I, I want to hear what you have to say about. It. Oh, well, yeah. I, well, so the reason I do five is because it's usually easy for people to run three things by. And mm-hmm. you have to work a little harder to come with the fourth and the fifth. Mm-hmm. So, okay. um, but it's, the same, it's just, it's echoing what you said. Like, it's destabilizing in a good way because it's helping you realize, wait a minute, I don't have to live in this lockdown paradigm that I've got myself in. And so you are going to have a little disequilibrium. I honestly think when you access different parts of yourself, you're center literally changes, Mm -hmm. that you are bigger energetically and psychologically, because now you have more access to more of your own wisdom. And so five good things about my anger. Okay, I I know it's a warning. I have to protect myself. Someone's uh, penetrated my boundaries. When I see or or, or have an injustice done to me, it's like, okay, Um, it tells me... um, that I'm fed up with a situation. Like it may not be painful, but like getting stuck for me, I had a lot of anger. I was angry at myself. Mm -hmm. Well then do something about it. Like it doesn't feel good. A lot of these messages, but the, the gift was I, I kept searching and moving toward healing. So that anger was definitely part of it. Mm -hmm. It's also about, um, defending yourself. Like just honoring that you feel angry and that, it's trying to make you know something. So I might uh, then uh, say, for example, in a work situation, and I talk about that in the book when I, I literally blew up at work. Thank God I didn't have witnesses. But it woke <laughs> me up to the fact that it was time to go. And I wrote about this in the book because I was very ashamed. There's my primary parts. I'm, I am nice. I love people. And all of that's true. So anger scared me originally. But my anger told me, I need to go. out. Of, I need to leave this work situation. And it doesn't matter if it's correct. I was done. And so it helps you not behave in a good way sometimes. It may, because I have obedient selves and responsible selves that tell me that I should put other people first all the time. Well, that makes people feel angry. But the anger is good because you shouldn't always. Sometimes you should, but it can't be by default. If you're always putting other people ahead of you, that's a codependent habit. That's, that's something that needs healing. So your anger... Mm -hmm. whether it's passive aggressive or kind of that low lying irritability, it comes in all kinds of forms is telling you something's off. Let's look into see what it is. And then if you needed your negotiator or your diplomat parts to handle the situation, that does not mean use destructive means. When I left that job, I did it with grace and I actually had so many gifts from that job. I really left very grateful for the time I spent there. And I'm still friendly with everyone. But if my angry self had done it, I would have destroyed everything good that was there and still is good to me today. Like I learned so much clinically at this place. So just because you feel the anger, it doesn't mean you have to deal with the situation via your angry self. Okay. So it's almost like you're... you're um your inner director or your inner script writer steps in, right, so to speak, yeah. and yeah. takes charge or manager take, comes and takes charge of things. How, how similar, I don't know if you've ever done some digging in it, because I know you're very well versed in inner uh, voice dialogue, but how similar is this to, and how different are this from like e- ego state therapy or internal family systems or gestalt chair work or things like that. There's probably more similarities than differences between those. I know from ego state therapy, uh, that seems to be more of like getting getting everything kind of unified, especially with uh, people who have uh, dissociative identity disorder, um, which is kind of an old model of looking at the self, whereas in, in internal family systems, it seems like there's this idea of like, not necessarily trying to force the parts to to get get in line with a, a, a unity sense of self, but to allow the person to see that there's a kind of creative ability in this creation of the parts that's kind of like 
uh, to, to use a, a hypnosis term, like the hidden observer that's kind of mm-hmm. regulating the whole show or the direct, the hidden director, if you will. I don't know if you have any thoughts on that or, uh, you know, if you think what I said is off or... I think what you said is totally on. And I agree that all, all everything you mentioned has a lot in common. Some of the foundational um, or the foundation of all of it is that we are made of different selves and that there's a hidden observer in voice dialogue. We would call that the aware ego process, that it's a process. It continues to grow. And I think Some of the big differences is partly technique. With voice dialogue, you literally go to another part of the room. If you can, or if you don't have a big room, you move over. So you get a visceral embodied sense of this part of you. Because as you know, something like all communication is only 7% words. And voice dialogue really holds that. So if I were to have a voice dialogue session, say with someone's really teeny inner child, the actual time with that inner child may be completely nonverbal, completely. I would just energetically be in presence. And then the person who goes to their very small inner child might just be in a ball rocking or anything and just being aware of themselves physiologically, energetically. And then when we go back to center, we talk about it from the adult point of view, whatever insights there were, or one of the big questions is, Now, how do you take care of your own inner child? Many of us are being taken care of by our little four-year-old selves. Well, that's another reason you get stuck. You can't have your four-year-old move your business from like a private practice uh, situation with one person into, say, creating a group practice. Your inner four-year-old is not the person to be in charge. And you have to first realize that awareness is the of course, first step for any of this. And then I think with voice dialogue in particular, there's this idea that it's a completely healthy model. You can have ill parts. It's not that it denies illness at all. But the idea is that you potentially have lots of different parts. You can certainly cultivate parts. And I would argue we all, whether we use that model or not, we were talking earlier about varying illnesses. You know, someone goes along and they get a diagnosis Now they have a part that has to deal with this diagnosis. Or when you're younger, you go from uh, middle school to teenage to young adult. So all of those natural developmental phases naturally inspire the growth of different parts. And part of the reason we can get stuck developmentally is we don't grow those parts. We enter the age, we become 30, but maybe we really haven't moved into the early adult parts because it wasn't safe or we didn't know or and that's to be explored individually but uh so i think with voice dialogue one of the biggest differences is the embodiment but also not having a super imposition like this is called your um firefighters or something like that. We would have firefighters, but some of those namings would come from the client. The client would say, well, this is my firefighter, as opposed to voice dialogue doesn't have categories other than primary cells we lead with and uh, hidden cells or shadow cells um, or disowned selves. And then all of them serve the purpose of protection. A lot of that can be dysfunction, but every single self, regardless of what it is, serves to protect you against vulnerability. And I think most parts work would agree with that. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, Well, that's good. I mean, it it sounds like it's more of a creative um, interaction on some levels, right? I mean, I think all therapy, if it's working right, has a lot of creativity in it uh, because creativity is kind of contagious if you can get people on board with it and it helps them become less stuck in, in their stuck places. It's more fluid, right? More of a sense of flow. Uh, between parts or aspects of themselves. Now, this is, I, I read through the book and it, there's a lot of work going on in here, but you also talk about the idea, the fact that you, when you're doing parts work, you're going to be rubbing up against your growth edges and, and, and that's a lot of work. So uh, uh, you do <laughs> mention militant self-care. Um, so militant, uh, uh, it's, it sounds kind of like an oxymoron, militant and self-care, but, but um, 
you mean it. Like you like you really have to take care of yourself. But tell us a little bit about how you do that. What and how could it be applied elsewhere besides uh, working on the final eighth? Like how could you apply it in your life? So obviously self care on some level is like one of those terms we bandy about now. It's very popular. Oh, yeah. you gotta practice self care. And that's one of the reasons I said, no, militant self-care. Like, don't be casual about your self-care because a few things. One is it recognizes that you are entering, uh, one could almost call it sort of a vision quest. I know you have a hypnotherapy as part of what you do. Well, when you go to different parts of yourself, you are entering an altered state because it's not your, uh, your, it's not your usual state. It doesn't mean necessarily you're high as a kite, although we have parts. I sometimes have people go to the part of them that loves a particular substance. And this is a way people can also that maybe are struggling with dependence. And I might say, go to the part of you that loves even cocaine, something like that. So we go to that part and that part is high and just is their cocaine self goes back to center And then the person realizes you don't need cocaine. Look, you have that part of you that can just be the thing that you thought you needed cocaine to get there. So that's one. I'm going a little off the self-care path. But 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 the idea is when you do the work, you are really going to the edges. So you have to counter those edges with uh, grounding yourself. And so a few things, most of us, I would argue, tell me if you disagree, haven't been taught very good self-care. You're not coming to therapy because you were soothed in a good way, because you were mirrored so appropriately, because faces <laughs> lit up when you went into the room. You know, that's you don't know self-care because you didn't grow up with having that understanding that it was okay to not feel well and then to go get soothing for it. So it's actually, I feel, a an, an, it's like medicine. You're learning how to be different with yourself. And that's part of the self accepting. And so my definition of self care is very broad. It could be like, I need to take a bath and disappear. Or it means, wow, I need to get my taxes together. I put them under the same thing. Because if you are like, I'm so overwhelmed that I can't deal with taxes. Okay, that's fine for a short period of time. But if again, if you're up against your growth edge and you want to have a business that has heft and seriousness, you cannot like taxes, but then you better figure out a system where your taxes are done or you're not going to grow wealth. You're not going to grow. Um, you're not going to also feel confident in yourself because you will so secretly know that on this great foundation, there's a huge bunch of crumbling underneath because your finances are not supporting your growth, for example. So my self-care isn't just warm and fuzzy, go get a massage. It certainly includes it. But it really might be, let me dare to call the, my friends and say, who do you recommend as an accountant? I put that all under the umbrella of militant self-care. And I also call it the M word as in maturation, because you can't grow. It's a form of maturation. And again, our society has such a, I don't even know what word, but uh, fear of maturation instead of enjoyment of maturation. Whoa, I got my taxes together. Now I'm free to be creative I'm with my private practice. I tell practitioners that are moving into private practice, have fun with it. What's your, how do you want to furnish it? Literally, who are your people? Are you, are you a, a goth? Well, then there's a ton of goths who would love your sensibility. So don't pretend you have to be everything. Say, I'm a goth and I understand that world and why people are attracted and what people need. So I really encourage people to do that. And that's part of the militant self-care. But because, say, you, you, I don't know what people's idea of goth is. It's whatever you think. But that doesn't mean this goth, like, go to the edge personas don't also need the soft um, cuddle with the kitten parts. And that's where the self-care comes in as well, that you get to be both. Okay. So maturation, yeah, I think we do have a uh, a fear of getting old. I mean, old is considered bad, young is considered good, right? Um, I I think a lot of boomers have been working really hard to remain uh, uh, on the planet infinitely. <laughs> I think you know, and everybody once they reach thirty or forty, they start to feel creaks and whatnot in the in their body, or they they 
don't have as much energy, so they work out more. But and which is good self care, and certainly you know having having your body be running and efficiently up until the day you you, you shuffle off this mortal coil is great. But this it does kind of cater to the young or or, or youthness, and there is a, an ageism certainly. And uh, but ageism doesn't mean maturity. You know, Correct. age doesn't mean maturity, right? So maturity is like you. I've known plenty of people in high school or junior high who had a lot more wisdom and maturity than I did at the time. Looking back now, so I think it's more of just like, like kind of being solid in yourself and and knowing you need to do X, Y, and Z, and also have some fun. Having exactly. having that cocaine part that comes out and and. Uh, feels euphoric and a little manic. <laughs> exactly. Right? But if you need to like clean your basement or finish your dissertation, maybe you really do want that energy and you don't want the cocaine. I, I recommend trying this. The other thing you just said, it's I agree with. And one of the reasons I decided to go back to school and become a therapist, I felt like I want to be part of this next wave, which is having the gift of longevity, statistically, because we are living longer. And old people, whatever that means, often, you're right, they don't mature, and then they are bitter. They left the good. I had to leave youth because I'm a certain age now. And so they're just bitter. They're like, I'm youth or I'm not youth. And the truth is, if we have a awakened relationship with aging, it can be so different than it ever was on this planet. And I want to be a part of that. Dr. Hal Stone, who passed away at 93 in his bed, in his sleep, just this past spring, really helped me change my my relationship with aging. And, and it was part of, and, and many people. But he said, as you get more in tune with all of your different parts, including the grief of, say, your strong part used to be able to run marathons, and now your strong part can, you know, take a walk around the block. If you are in touch with your vulnerability and can shift your behavior so that it honors the truth of the vulnerability of the aging, you can live with youthful vigor for decades. And, and that's, I'm, I want to be part of that wave where it's like, no, you can mourn the loss of your youth. And I think that's a lot of it. It, there's stuff to mourn. I think a lot of just psychotherapy itself is a grief process. You do have to let go of X and there's grief there. But the good news is now you can move into Y. And so that's that he really did. A, he and Sidra, his wife, who is still alive, talked a lot about the aging process and how if you bring consciousness to it, you can have this extraordinary final decades. And I agree. And how Hal came to it, he literally uh, went, was like in his 70s, went and had fixed something on his roof, climbed up the roof in his 70s, and then came down. They were expecting luncheon guests. And he was like, oh, I got to do one more thing. Went back on the roof, fell off and broke his back oh, That's in his wow. mid-70s. Wow. Now, in his youth, he could have gone up a second time. And what, while he was literally disabled, he fully recovered, no paralysis, but he for weeks was 100% dependent, which is not how he self-defined from his primary cells. And he realized he wasn't his, he, he was competing with his inner 20 year old. Who's like, just pop back up and finish that X, Y, and Z. And it was after that, he realized, you know what, if I pay attention and honor what I cannot do anymore physically, I can live much more fully. And that's what he did. He lived at 20-ish years more. Wow. Fully physical and mental capacity until he the mortal coil left. So that was so inspiring. And I'm glad we're talking about this because I think the dedication to this type of work is really life enhancing and longevity enhancing. I think um, there's a book in there. Oh, I think there's a book in there for you. I think that um, you have a lot of stories there and a lot of experience with this. Maybe, maybe I'll I'll talk to Sidra because it certainly comes from her and she's still around. Maybe we maybe, could uh, do something yeah, because she'd yeah. be the living. She'd be the, she is the living example right now. She's eighty 
four, I believe, at the at the moment that we're talking. Yeah, I mean, she certainly would have a lot of stories uh, uh, about her husband, right? I mean, wow. And herself, because they co-developed voice dialogue. I mean, there it's just incredible. So thanks for that. A great idea. Plus, yeah. I love Sidra, so it could be a great way to yeah, be with yeah. her a lot. It could be uh, it could be kind of a hoot. Yeah. Yeah, and learn a lot too. No, I think that uh, this idea of, of, of maturity and embracing that rather than uh, running away from it. You know, in a lot of societies outside of currently in Western societies, I'll say like like global consumer Western society, um, there is a respect for elders. And there is a respect for tradition. Uh, sometimes to uh, to a high, to such a high degree that it eclipses um, rationality uh, and frustrates people, but the idea of, of um, getting the support and and that that uh, wealth of knowledge from someone who has maturity has matured right uh, is is still embodied in places like South Asia and, and Asia and and. You know, even in, in, in different parts of the world or Native American culture, for I instance. I was just going to yeah. say, yeah. yeah. This idea of like, you know, you actually get better. It's like, you know, we, we don't like a bottle of, if you drink scotch, you don't like a bottle of scotch that's a year old. It's not quite ripe, right? Or a bottle of wine that, that sits longer and, and has, you know, has more maturity to it. Um, and I think people are like that as well. And in fact, I've been hearing lately that uh, Native American and other indigenous uh, people are prioritizing with more ferociousness the vaccination for COVID because they really want to learn the languages that will disappear with their elders. Absolutely. And so yeah. I'm agreeing. And actually, right now, it's almost um, coming to the forefront again and being quite politically important to save and help the elders, so that they can teach before they go. That's how valued their knowledge is. Like, if this person dies, yeah. then an entire encyclopedia of our ancestral knowledge will be gone forever. And I can't support that enough. Well, yeah, I mean, even if you have no particular interest in learning, you know, uh, Navajo or, or learning, you know, an Anishinaabe tongue or something or a Jibwa or Iroquois, you, it's a world treasure. And uh, because they're an indigenous uh, cultures, they have more connection to nature. And I think in, in a lot of the languages don't have like concrete verbs. They have or concrete uh, 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 nouns. They have a lot of just verbs for things. Like nouns are verbs too. So it's it's a different perspective about um, life being in flux rather than you know life being solid. You know, starts here. You you gather a bunch of things, and ownership isn't. You know, it affects the mind. And I think that that languages that um, they should not be subsumed entirely by post-colonial English. <laughs> no, exactly. And they yeah. also have concrete, like in terms of na na nature, whatever. Yeah. Yeah. And also resilience. These are people who survived oppression. And so I think there's also yeah. that, mm -hmm. the, how they did it. I think, so I'm just agreeing and I'm adding, yeah. like, like talk about rev reverence for the maturity and the strength of someone who lives many decades on this planet. So thank you for this. I, I'm getting chills to think about how exciting it could be to explore this further for the well, next book. I never I, thought of that. I, I think you have something in there, uh, another niche that you're finding in there, uh, another space within um, inner voice dialogue, right? Um, yeah. I'm, it's I'm funny curious. because Sidra always called voice dialogue the fountain of youth. Is not <laughs> because because it really you moving to different parts and coming back your your tension releases, and so some of it I think is physiological. Like you literally your blood is flowing better because you're not so tense after you go to a self say even a tense self oh, and you yeah, come back. Yeah. But it's so funny, um, and we could yeah the M word is the fountain of youth. <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> I think, well, uh, the fact that you're able to step in and out of these roles makes you more fluid in your presentation and you're, you're more of a, um, openness to new experiences, if you will. Um, all things that are good. And typically people who just, you know, the people who come to you don't come to you because they're not stuck <laughs> for, for mental right. health issues, right? They're seeking help because they're stuck in some way, shape or form. And yeah. even just learning that they can have this more fluidity and sense of, sense of ownership of their parts and their selves, right? So uh, they don't, something out of the shadow doesn't keep pulling on their leg to look at it and they keep ignoring it because they don't want to. I'm curious, do, do you ever create parts with inner voice dialogue? Because um, sometimes in hypnosis for creativity, I might have someone put two aspects of themselves or uh, use um, uh, a role model that they would step in, uh, a term that in Ericksonian uh, psychotherapy and hypnosis is called um, trans identification or deep trans identification, or um, I think... Vladimir Rykov was a Russian psychologist who would have people, uh, he would call it like a, 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 a kind of pseudo reincarnation where you would have somebody become Rachmaninoff and, and play the piano or, or play the piano like Mendelssohn. So, uh, and this has been done a lot. Um, I'm wondering if you utilize creation of parts or elicitation of role models sometimes to, to bring out those parts of themselves or... Yeah, I'm just imagining you as the alchemist of the psyche because it's so fun. So, yes, 100 percent. I'll give you a very concrete example is I was working with a client. and We were doing voice dialogue and this client had a job that was for her a money job, but she liked it well enough. But it was a very creative job. It was also a lot of money for a part time job. And she and she kept getting in trouble at work. And it was, there was, uh, she was protected by a union, but she would get to trouble over and over so much. It involved her union. Her bosses were unhappy with her. So a few things I said, look, do you want this job? Because if she didn't want the job, I was not going to be like, let's work on the part of leaving the job because you're acting out. By the way, she was being written up for all the right reasons. Like she was acting out. She was not doing a good job. And so what we ended up, she ended up saying, yes, I need the job. I want the job. And so I said, all right, well, what she, and she had a lot of trauma. And what happened was she was bringing her rebellious eight year old inner little boy. Um, and that's, we can be all genders, as you know, to work. And this little eight year old boy was unsafe at work, of course, and acting out all over the place and then, uh, pouting. And, and so I'm like, look, if you actually want the job, no one's interested in your pouting little eight-year-old boy. They have enough work to do. Your supervisor is not interested in babysitting you. She wants an adult who will just do her job. And so my client said, what, does that mean I have to be fake all the time? And I said, maybe, let's try it. And we created a fake self. So she moved over. And so she's like, so, so I just like, I'm just nice. And I said, yeah, you're fake, right? <laughs> exactly. And, and she really had to explore it. And, I, and she okay. said, and I said, and then when we came back to center, I said, you know, you're defining fake as someone who doesn't just express their emotions in the moment spontaneously. And if that's fake to you, fine. Well, one of the things she, and in voice dialogue, the client names the self. Well, calling it her fake self actually amused her. And being amused helped her not be in lockdown and be so angry, which was appropriate. But so when we would meet over the next many weeks, she'd come in and say, Bridget, you'd be so proud of me. I was so fake all day. <laughs> and she was thrilled because she did need it. That was an adult self. And if you, if, and then also voice dialogue, we're like, well, how do you define fake? I know my definition. I want to hear. Well, for her, it was, if you have emotions and you don't express them right away, that's fake. Well, that's not my definition of fake. That's acting out potentially. And also that's not looking around like, okay, but then everyone's welcome to do that. So that was a very successful because she kept that job as long as she wanted it. In fact, the job ended because the company shifted and then took the position and, 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 uh, eradicated it. Mm. 
And so it was so successful. And I love that story because well, she needed a fake self. Yes, sir. Well, maybe maybe she needed to feel like she was pulling the, the wool over someone's eyes. Oh, this isn't me, but hey, this is working. Right. Yeah. Um, exactly. And also the wool over the eyes, I think, helped the uh, eight-year-old acting out. Like, fine. You think I, I actually like this? I'll bring in my eight-year-old self. I think it like pleased a lot of selves. So the, the, eight-year-old, the eight-year-old self probably got a kick out of, of, of putting them on, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So, and you had to probably negotiate with that part a lot, I think. Well, you know, once we realized that she did want the job and we really honored the wounding of this little eight-year-old. This eight-year-old was, that's what happens. We just, I think this happens with all the parts where compassion is like a side effect. I don't ask anybody to be compassionate, but it comes out. So we ended up just loving the strength of this little eight-year-old who survived horrific stuff. So I think that was, that's what the eight-year-old really wanted. We didn't do it to be manipulative. Mm -hmm. And so what happened was we didn't actually have to negotiate that much because we ended up just loving that part. And then that part didn't have to do the adult stuff. That part could just be a wounded Mm eight-year-old who liked to sometimes kick things. And then I tell people, get big fat phone books and things, kick it around. You have to do something with that energy. And Mm -hmm. so so we didn't because we actually took care of the deeper needs of that eight-year-old very wounded, very strong. And my client would not be as successful as she was, even as even stuck with this rough work situation without that eight year old. And Mm -hmm. I think that eight year old felt so validated, Mm -hmm. but then it was the M word time. She had to be mature and no supervisors have enough on their plate to deal with the eight year olds acting out of their co of their workforce. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Wow. Even if they wanted to, who's got time. Exactly. Exactly. Well, it seems like you're 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 really um, enjoying this still. You've been at this for how many years? Thirty years? You've been doing voice dialogue work. 20? Yeah, but I stumbled on it. What? Let's see. Ninety four is when I first read about it, and you're right. I love it. Ninety four, oh four, fourteen. Uh, so yeah, almost thirty years. Twenty six. And yes, yeah. wow. Yeah. It's um yeah. so invigorating, and it never gets old because there's always more to play with, and it's so healing. I mean. It is my heal. One of the tools. I won't say it's the only one because it wasn't. For me, feeling healed and then mm-hmm. able to share and just have such joy about it. I love it. I mean, wow. the idea of like, hmm, should I go to my cocaine self? What kind of life is that? Without <laughs> having, and it's so cheap, you know. Yeah. It's, yeah. And no worry about a felony. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Absolutely. No jail time for you, um, which is a, an added bonus to most psychotherapies, I think. <laughs> right. Well, on that, cheaper than bail. On that, high, oh, on, that, sorry. on that high note, um, uh, I will um, I think we could sign off. Everybody, the book is The Final Eighth. It is by uh, published by New World Library and Bridget. Uh, Oh my goodness! I forgot your your. That's okay, Bridget Dangle. Bridget Dangle Bas- Gaspard, and she has a website, correct? I have a website, thefinaleighth.com, and every Thursday, third Thursday, every third Thursday of the month at eight p.m. Eastern, I have a free virtual voice dialogue learning lab with cool. my colleague Eric Patempa. So come and join us free. Just contact me for the info, anybody who's listening. And it's every third Thursday of the month at 8 p.m. So you can see voice dialogue live in action because it often it's so experiential. Um, it's really helpful to see it. And yeah. uh, so please join us. Awesome. OK, well, I hope you, uh, people out there do so. Thank you so much. Hope we can have you back on. I'm okay. looking forward to being here. Thanks, Scott. All right. Stay safe. You too. Thanks for listening to the Psychology Talk podcast. Did you know that the Psychology Talk podcast has a Facebook page and an Instagram page? It's true. You can find more information about other guests and episodes, as well as more information about psychology and mental health. And if you liked this episode, 
Go ahead and like us on Apple Podcasts, Spreaker, Stitcher, or Spotify and leave a review. It helps us grow our audience and provide more quality shows. All material, copyright the Psychology Talk podcast. This podcast is for informative and entertainment purposes only. If you need a mental health professional, please seek one out. Music is provided by the band Serenati. Serenati.